149. Treasures and Trifles In the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord declares, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. These words have deep roots in biblical thoughts and in Hebraic proverbs reflecting that faith. Thus, in the Apocrypha, in Tobit chapter 4, verse 9, and the Psalm of Solomon, chapter 9, verse 9, we are told, He who does righteousness lays up life for himself with the Lord. And in the Testament, Levi, chapter 13, verse 5, Do righteousness, my sons on earth, that you may have treasure in heaven. When King Monobasas of Adiabene, 46 to 47 AD, Embraced Judaism in a time of famine, he gave away his inherited wealth, declaring, My father's stored in a place where the hand can reach, but I have stored in a place where the hand cannot reach. My father's gathered for this world, but I have gathered for the future world. Obviously, the concept of treasure in heaven was a well-established one uncommon to all teachers in Israel. Treasure meant righteousness, the obedience of faith to the law of God. It meant the confidence of the regenerate man in the government of God and his security therein, and hence his faith in and obedience to the covenant God. In terms of this new view of the meaning of treasure and security, the redeemed man regards what was once wealth to him as a trifle by comparison to his inheritance in Christ. St. Paul is even more emphatic as he contrasts his previous condition, a very wealthy man who believed in justification by works of the law, to his redemption and justification through the atonement of Jesus Christ. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. The contrast made by both our Lord and St. Paul rests on the fact that all men have an idea of what constitutes a treasure and what, by contrast, is a trifle. Men build their lives on this evaluation. The parable of the hidden treasure illustrates this fact. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the fields, the which when a man hath found he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all he hath, and buyeth that field. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. A man's treasure, thus, is the governing faith in his life, the motive force which governs his thoughts, words, and actions. The same is true of a society or culture. Its treasure is whatever faith governs its life, and its trifles will be those things regarded as either peripheral, irrelevant, or even an impediment to life. Paul regarded his previous treasure as dung after his conversion. To illustrate this fact on the current world scene, Hedrick Smith points out that In Russia, the law means nothing. What matters most is power. The Russian obeys power, not the law. The treasure for Russians is naked power. 
In the West, power must be disguised with humanitarian and equalitarian trappings because a treasure or governing faith is more closely linked to a humanism still governed by perversions of Christian compassion. However, the treasure principle in Western thought is clearly anti-Christian. Harold O.J. Brown called attention to one aspect of this treasure principle. There is an old Latin maxim, de minimis non curat lex. The law is not concerned with trifles. Turned around, it might say. Whatever the law is not concerned with is a trifle of no importance. Where the law claims to be unconcerned with morality, it is educating the public to believe that morality is of trifling importance. And this is the message that comes through in countless aspects of American public life. Let us examine briefly where the treasure principle is to be found in modern society. First, very clearly, its locale is in man. Man is a treasure, and the cardinal principle in all social action and status legislation is the welfare of man. Man, moreover, is seen as autonomous, but his autonomy is not from other men, but from God. We are told that people need people, which is quite logical in terms of the religious presupposition. If we believe God to be ultimate, we will recognize that all men need God and that no true life exists apart from Him. On the other hand, if our faith is in man, then the idea of living in isolation from man is anathema. Man must be close to other men in order to fulfill his being. Thus, medieval man often withdrew from other men even abstaining from speech, into conventual life, in order to be closer to God. This was seen not as a punishment, but as a higher way of life. Now, solitary confinement is regarded as one of the worst forms of punishment. Again, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, 1719 to 1720, reflected the Puritan resourcefulness and independence from men and the strength of reliance on God. On a desert island, Crusoe found communion with God, created a culture, and developed the resources of that island. In the 20th century, the fictional Robinson Crusoes are men who are castaways from God, and their hope is in man. Crusoe, through the Bible and prayer, established fellowship with God. The modern Crusoes are trying to overcome the communications gap to end alienation by establishing communion with themselves and their fellow men. Second, modern law is therefore concerned with man, how to educate, nurse, feed and employ man and how to enable man better to glorify and enjoy himself. The moral foundation of the law is thus human welfare, a changing concept in terms of the changing and developing needs of man. Like the ancient Romans, modern man has come to believe that the fundamental legal principle is that the health or welfare of the people is the highest law. To achieve this, Whatever sacrifice is necessary must be made, it is held. Third, because man is the basic treasure, because the religion of modern society is humanism, the principle of the equality of man governs modern law. It is a theological and logical necessity that, in any religion, there be an equality in the Godhead. Inequality in the principle of ultimacy is an impossibility, a contradiction in terms and ideas. Therefore, if man is ultimate, if man is God, then all men are equal. The equality of men is an historical lie, 
a scientific fiction and a factual impossibility because the concept of equality is an abstraction and man is not a mathematical abstraction. The concepts of equality and inequality are thus not applicable to something as varied and particular as humanity. Particular men are not the universals of man. Very obviously, too, modern man has problems with the idea of his equality and inequality. Both concepts trouble him. If either is applied in society, legal problems and very serious social problems ensue. Humanistic man, however, much as he dislikes the problems of equality and inequality, cannot drop the problem, as a Christian can, because his religious principle, his faith in man, requires it. The problem dominates politics and whatever course politicians take, whether in Britain, South Africa or the United States, whether they opt for equality or inequality, the consequences are only trouble because the premise is in any case a false one. On the other hand, what modern man and the modern state regard as trifles, not treasures, is equally a problem to society. First, God and faith in the triune God is regarded as a trifle. It is either peripheral to, left out of, or banned, depending on the country, from the state schools. American philosophers of statist education have been vocal about their faith in man, and equally vocal that something so divisive as biblical faith should be left out of education as both a danger and yet a trifle. A matter of private option and opinion. A fundamental declaration of Scripture is that God is a jealous God. Exodus chapter 20 verse 5, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 24, Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8, who will not share his ultimacy and glory with any other. In terms of this, what modern man regards as a trifle is thus the very ground of his judgments and forthcoming destruction. Because his culture treasures a reprobate principle, modern man is reprobate and doomed. Second, biblical law is regarded as an alien and obsolete trifle whose only place is in a library as a relic of the past, a museum piece. The idea that law must stem from the God of Scripture rather than the humanistic state is seen as alien and unrealistic. It is unrealistic because the new principle of reality is seen as man. Hence, law must be made by man and governed by human needs, not God, it is believed. Law gears a society to reality. If the reality is God, then law comes from God. If the reality is man, then law comes from man. Third, whereas equality, or in some instances inequality, is the treasure principle of humanistic society, for godly man it is knowledge, righteousness, holiness and dominion. This means knowing God's word, law and world, believing and obeying God's word and law, and applying it to gain dominion under God. Practically, in the realm of law, this means justice in terms of God's law. Justice, however, in this sense, is a trifle to modern man, although he still retains the word. Walter Kaufman in Without Guilt and Justice, 1973, has argued that, because the idea of justice is inseparable from the idea of God and his law and punishment for transgressions against him and his law, modern man must abandon the concept of justice itself. This is clearly a logical conclusion, and it is only the still strong Christian undercurrents which have prevented the wholesale adoption of this philosopher's logical conclusion. 
clearly. Our view of what constitutes treasures and trifles is important and does govern what we are and what we do. Moreover, we must say that modern man regards unreal and dangerous trifles as his treasures. If he continues in this path, the consequences will be deadly. Our Lord is emphatic. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 The alternative to bread alone is not idealism nor humanism. It is the every word of God. If our heart is there, if our treasure is that every word, then neither our lives, our law, nor our societies will be grounded upon trifles, or, as our Lord stated it, upon sand, upon an unstable foundation. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Man's ideas of discretion bring trifles to the law, and it is presumption for man to take God's word and add his own to it. To live by God's every word means to forsake our word 